identify a one health identify a one health approach strategy for prevention of public health threats identify a one health approach strategy for detection of public health threats identify a one health approach strategy for responding to public health threats and list two ways to improve collaborative practice across the public health care team next slide in compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses or partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there's no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Next slide. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash continuing education the course access code is zohu webcast to receive free ce for today's webcast complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash tce online by july 4th 2022 a captioned video of today's webinar will be posted at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash 2022 slash june.html within 30 days. To receive free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by July 5th, 2024. Next slide. We've received approval for AA SVB race accreditation for all Zohu call webinars. If you would like to receive continuing education for AA SVB race for the April 6th and May 4th, 2022 webinars, please follow instructions for web on demand only. Beginning with today's June 1st webinar, CE is available using either webcast or web on demand as usual. Next slide. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Kate Varela, Preventive Medicine Fellow with the One Health Office will share some news and updates. You can begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the June Zohu call. We appreciate you being here today. Before our presentations begin, I'd like to share some updates. You can find links to these resources in today's Zohu call email newsletter. And if you aren't yet subscribed to the newsletter, please use the link at the top of the main Zohu call webpage to sign up. Our response to the COVID-19 pandemic continues to evolve. You can check CDC's website for the latest guidance and resources, including information about keeping people as well as animals safe and healthy. And while there is no evidence that animals are playing a significant role in spreading COVID-19 to people, we continue to see a variety of different animals reported with SARS-CoV-2. The latest animal, animal case numbers are available on the USDA APHIS website and guidance for pet owners, mink farmers, and many others are available on CDC's website. Next slide. Today's newsletter highlights several recent publications, including a generalizable One Health framework for the control of zoonotic diseases that was recently published in Nature Scientific Reports. This framework includes five specific steps and corresponding activities to help users develop capacity to coordinate zoonotic disease programs across sectors and is applicable to common zoonotic diseases in most settings. Another publication we wanted to highlight is an MMWR report Rabies and a Dog Imported from Azerbaijan, Pennsylvania, 2021. Next slide. And recently published in Water and Health, Characterization of Reported Legionellosis Outbreaks Associated with Buildings Served by Public Drinking Water Systems, United States, 2001 to 2017. Next slide. We've shared links to several announcements and web resources, including a health advisory, Monkeypox virus infection in the United States and other non-endemic countries, 2022, and the 2019 NARMS update integrated report summary. Next slide. Here are some observances of interest. National Pet Preparedness Month is being observed throughout the month of June. 
and World Environment Day and World Food Safety Observance Days are coming up next week. Next slide. And continuing to highlight events and observances, an AMR exchange webinar called Antifungal Resistance, Understanding This Glo Growing Global Threat will take place on June 7th. And the American Veterinary Medical Association's annual convention is taking place July 29th through August 2nd in Philadelphia. Next slide. Finally, we've included information on outbreak investigations, including a new salmonella outbreak linked to peanut butter. You can visit CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website for a selected list of ongoing and past US outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. And we appreciate you sharing the Zohu Call website link with your colleagues from the human, plant, animal, and environmental health sectors and letting them know about the live webinars, video recordings, and free continu continuing education that this call offers. Our next Zohu call will take place in two months on August 3rd. So we hope everyone has an enjoyable 4th of July if you're in the United States. And please continue to send presenter and topic suggestions for future presentations, as well as news from your organization to zohucall at cdc.gov. And that's Z-O-H-U-C-A-L-L -L at cdc.gov. And now I'll turn the call back over to Laura. Thank you, next slide. You may submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please include the topic or presenter's name. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation if time permits. You can also email questions to today's presenters. We've included their email addresses on this slide, on the Zahoo Call webpage for today's webinar, and in today's email newsletter. Next slide, please. Our first presentation, Zoonotic Influenza Reference Guide, Orientation to a New Public Health Resource is by Meg Schaefer. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Laura. And thank you to all of those joining in via the webinar today or recording. Next slide, please. The Zoonotic Influenza Reference Guide is intended to serve as a repository of up-to-date information on animal and zoonotic influenza that addresses major events of interest lesser known viruses with the potential for future impact, isolated events with any probability of human impact. The guide has extensive information on surveillance, epidemiology, prevention and control of events of animal outbreaks, as well as novel human infections, animal zoonotic influenza viruses. The guide is ultimately intended to support state, local, tribal, territorial, uh, and city health officials and international health officials in acquiring rapid situational awareness on an animal or zoonotic influenza event, including novel human infections, but also provides a broad and extensive background on historical information about influenza in humans and animals with the ever-changing landscape of influenza viruses, including the most recent outbreak and ongoing outbreak of highly pathogenic avian flu in our domestic and wild poultry in birds, the presence and emergence within other species, as well as improved surveillance and epidemiologic mechanisms. This guide provides a comprehensive resource to support future protections of animal and human health. Next slide, please. The reference guide was a collaborative development process and the link was just posted, thanks to Helen, on the comment section to the right. The reference guide is posted on the National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians website. The guide will also be linked to on the CDC One Health website, as well as the CDC Influenza Division and USDA APHIS. The links on nasphv.org contain a video orientation to the guide, some slides that will help you navigate the guide, as well as the guide itself. Next slide, please. This project was a born collaboration from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians, and the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. The work group that helped develop the guide, in addition to myself, was uh, various contributors and representatives from organizations such as CDC, State Public Health Veterinarians, State Veterinarians, CDC One Health, USDA APHIS Veterinarians, and State Epidemiologists. Next slide. 
the intended use is very broad. It's intended to provide a great background to state, tribal, local, territorial, and international public health officials. It's intended to be accessible, easy to use, and to provide an extensive number of references for those who want to learn more about zoonotic influenza and its transmission and the species it affects. The content of the guide was obtained through extensive textbook, journal article, and web resource reviews, as well as interviews with subject matter expert on the subject of zoonotic influenza, which included veterinarians, epidemiologists, and other animal health and public health professionals. The guide is organized both by species, animal species, and influenza subtypes, which should help facilitate searching by either. And there are helpful links throughout, as I'll go through later in the presentation. General information was provided on influenza virus strains, as well as background for potential situations, whether zoonotic transmission resulted in a human illness or not. And links to direct resources and publicly available resources were provided to the extent possible. Next slide. Now we're gonna go through document navigation. Next slide. The major sections of the guide include background, surveillance, epidemiology, prevention, and control. The first section on background goes over influenza virology, including the different types and strains, genetic sequencing, how influenza manifests in humans, including burden of disease, prevention, treatment, dominant seasonal strains, human pandemics of the last 130 years, influenza nomenclature, emerging threats to human health, and CDC's influenza risk assessment tool and how certain types and strains are scored and what those resulting scores are. Next slide. Here's a sampling of background information as it pertains to influenza in humans. On the left-hand side, you can see a summary of burden of disease, symptoms, transmission, risk factors. On the right is a graphic that shows a sampling of the information provided about notable pandemics or notable outbreaks, whether they became a pandemic or not. Next slide. This is also a snapshot of the background section, the influenza risk assessment tool. So the information was obtained from the IRET site as published by CDC. For certain types and strains of interest, the IRAT tool scores potential emergence, potential Im impact for a summary score and provides the date of evaluation. The IRAT score is provided throughout the tool as it pertains to the scoring of certain types and strains that present threats to human health. Next slide, please. Other major sections including, include species and strain overview. So while we just covered the human section, there are also sections specific to influenza and how it affects avian, including species differentiation, major sections on highly pathogenic and low pathogenicity strains, their emergence, their detection, lineage distinctions, and subtypes within those broad categories. There are also sections specific to swine, equine, canine and feline, bats, and other animals. Next slide. Here's a sampling of the guide as it pertains to influenza and avian. Here's the section on highly pathogenic and low pathogenicity avian influenza. And then on the right, there's a sampling of what would be called a strain specific section that describes when this particular strain was first detected, how it emerged and whether or not it spread to people. Next slide. This is a sampling of the section of influenza and swine. This section is slightly different from avian as it manifests in swine differently and has an endemicity in, in swine. This section shows the triple reassortant virus of 2009, but then also displays how CDC flu view tracks strain emergence in humans, as well as outbreaks among swine of unusual strains. Next slide. The last major section covers surveillance, epidemiology, prevention, and control. There are a multitude of resources throughout this portion of the text. There are US and international surveillance resources and a major section on human surveillance and epidemiology, which covers things like how seasonal influenza is surveyed, how to follow and track and trend the different types of seasonal viruses and how they're affecting people. Novel influenza emergence is reported by CDC FluView international surveillance of the emergence of novel cases of avian transmission to people and other situations of interest. 
also surveillance of other respiratory pathogens, including how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the distribution of seasonal influenza. There's also sections on epidemiology and transmission dynamics, forecasting, and prevention of control and influenza in humans. Next slide. This is a snapshot of a quick reference guide at the start of this major section of the document. This section shows how surveillance, uh, sorry, it shows surveillance resources for the different sections that might be affected. Human seasonal, human novel, avian swine, avian wild, and outbreak reports. And these resources are specific to US or domestic situations, as well as international. Next slide. This is also a, a snapshot within the surveillance epidemiology prevention and control section that covers human influenza and other respiratory pathogen surveillance. So while flu view is displayed on the left, there are many resources on the right that cover all of the different respiratory pathogens that could intersect with the seasonal flu virus. Next slide. <clears throat> also contained within this major section are subsections on avian influenza and swine influenza. And these are specific more to recent events and recent surveillance resources, including guides and resources on how to manage these situations if they emerge in your jurisdiction. For avian flu, topics covered include international surveillance, such as resources from OIE WAHIS and US surveillance of domestic poultry, wild birds, the impact of migratory flyways, infections of avian influenza virus in humans, as has just occurred in the state of Colorado, and prevention and control of those situations as they are detected. There are also components of the guide that cover epidemiology surveillance transmission within swine, how influenza viruses ebb and flow throughout marketing and production systems, and prevention and control of influenza in swine. There are also subsections on equine, canine, feline, and other animals. Next slide. This is a snapshot of the avian influenza surveillance section. So there are some avian specific resources for tracking and detecting and determining where outbreaks are occurring domestically and internationally in domestic poultry as well as wild birds. And a snapshot is there are graphics throughout the guide that show migratory flyways. Next slide. This is a snapshot of one of the resources provided in the guide, although there are many, many more resources provided at the end of the guide, things that you can publish or print out or provide to say agricultural fairs for use in trying to control and prevent the sp spread of influenza from animals to people. Next slide. This is a snapshot of a summary of human novel infections. And now there's an additional section on the first case of avian flu that occurred in humans in Colorado. Next slide. The last major section are resources. There are future considerations for zoonotic flu, public health resources, and three appendices. Next slide. Public health resources are quite extensive. They're sourced from CDC, USDA, NASAHO, uh, NASPHV, and various other uh, professional and federal organizations. Next slide. This is an appendix that shows the distribution of outbreaks by type and stream, world region, and year. Next slide. And a contact list to assess urgent situations or report urgent situations or get consultative um, information after hours and during working hours. Next slide. There are over 350 references in this guide. The references are hyperlinked. And if you go to the references section of the guide, you should be able to paste the DOI link into a browser or click directly on the link to retrieve the original article. Wherever possible, public access research articles were used, though several books, interviews, and websites were also used. Next slide. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. I hope you find the guide useful. And if you have any questions, comments, or would like to provide feedback, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Our next presentation, Sniffing Out SARS-CoV-2, a seroprevalence study of working dogs in Arizona, 
is by Gabriella Hecht. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Gabriella Hecht and I'm a CDC CSTE Applied Epidemiology Fellow assigned to the Arizona Department of Health Services. Um, I'll be presenting on a SARS-CoV-2 seroprevalence study among working dogs in Arizona. Next slide, please. Um, so zoonotic transmission of SARS-CoV-2 from humans to animals has been documented on a global scale. The risk of animal to human transmission, however, is considered to be low, though it has been documented in mink, hamsters, and deer. And one health approach is essential when conducting zoonotic disease investigations, specifically in this case, there's a need for connected SARS-CoV-2 investigations between animals and people. Next slide, please. Currently, there are hundreds of known cases of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 in canines globally, most occurring following close contact with a COVID-19 positive person. This work was conducted as part of the CSTE CDC pilot project for SARS-CoV-2 surveillance at the Human Animal Environmental Interface. Our original work looked at household companion animals and congregate animal settings and shelters, humane societies and rescues. Our recent work is looking at wildlife. We were interested in looking specifically at the working dog population because of concerns surrounding potential impacts of SARS-CoV-2 infection on canine scent detection ability. Next slide, please. So what is a working dog? Let's define that really quick. Um, I'm not referring to working group breeds as defined by AKC, for example, but rather to dogs trained to perform practical tasks. Working dogs are trained in specific rules and often are employed in meaningful work as opposed to serving in a pet or companionship role. Many agencies will employ working dogs trained for specific roles such as patrol, detection, search and rescue and crisis response. Employers include public safety organizations like law enforcement and military, organizations that require some degree of a security presence such as hospitals and airports, as well as private companies such as commercial drug dog LLCs that may serve residential treatment centers and schools uh, and others. So patrol work occurs in several different environments where dogs are stationed for security purposes to protect the public and maintain safety. Patrol dogs are trained to assist law enforcement officers through skills such as agility, tracking, searches, and handler protection. They may be deployed to pursue a fleeing suspect or conduct a building search. Some dogs serve more as a deterrent for criminal activity in public settings such as hospitals with high gang activity. Scent detection is a broad field that can be characterized either by the type of scent a dog is trained to detect, bomb dogs, for example, trained to detect explosives, drug dogs trained to detect narcotics, or by the type of work a dog is trained to perform, such as search and rescue dogs who detect human smell. Search and rescue dogs often serve in a role uh, locating missing persons. And lastly, crisis response dogs serve in a therapeutic role in a variety of settings and scenarios. It could be with crime victims at a fire scene, a natural disaster, um, and so on. A working dog also might be single purpose or dual purpose in that they might be trained for one role or two. For example, a police patrol dog is a single purpose dog. A police patrol dog cross-trained on explosive detection is a dual purpose dog and roles are often selected on ability, capacity, and need. Many patrol dogs, for example, are put through detection school if there's a need for more canines in that specific area or to enhance their capabilities in their daily role. Uh, next slide, please. So be assisting fire scene investigators through accelerant detection or serving in a crisis response role after a traumatic event, working dogs play a vital role in society, ensuring public health and safety is upheld. Despite the many settings where SARS-CoV-2 surveillance in animals has been established, even here in Arizona, in captive and free-ranging wildlife, companion animals, congregate animal settings, surveillance has not been implemented in working dog settings yet. It's particularly important to understand impacts of SARS-CoV-2 on scent detection and ability in this population, because unlike companion animals that may have trouble finding their favorite scented toy, working dogs rely on this ability for tasks such as confiscating large quantities of illicit substances, detecting minute amounts of C4 or TNT, locating human remains in the wake of a natural disaster, and so on. Next slide, please. We aim to conduct a zero survey of working dogs in Arizona to determine the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies in this population. We're also interested in identifying potential 
factors associated with transmission in working dogs and explore how uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection might impact their role. Next slide, please. We collaborated with a veterinary clinic in Phoenix, Arizona with a high working dog patient volume. Canines were enrolled at clinic visits where handler consent was obtained and a short questionnaire was administered to collect canine demographics, COVID-19 exposure status, and clinical signs. Serum was collected on all dogs for SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibody testing. And for those with recent SARS-CoV-2 compatible clinical signs or COVID-19 exposure, nasal and rectal swabs were collected for PCR testing. Next slide, please. Our study began November 30th of last year. And as of April 1st, our preliminary results show uh, our sample has 120 dogs enrolled, working dogs enrolled. 76% of the sample is male, 62% are of the Belgian Malinois breed, 67% are intact, and four, uh, the working dogs are 4.8 years on average, with a range from about one to 10 years. Next slide, please. So just over half of our dogs, 54% were single purpose. The majority, 58%, were trained in police patrol that could either be as a single or dual purpose uh, working dog. And the most common role held in our study by 40% of the sample is dual purpose police patrol and narcotics detection. So working dog roles ranged, scent detection roles included narcotics, explosive, cadaver, and accelerant detection dogs. Um, our study also included search and rescue dogs, hospital patrol dogs, and crisis response dogs. Next slide, please. We had a zero positivity rate of 25% with 30 out of 120 working dogs testing positive for SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies by enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA. Swabs from 13 dogs resulted in zero PCR positives for this study. Handlers reported clinical signs in 13% of zero positive dogs. And this, uh, the clinical signs included nasal discharge, lethargy, coughing, vomiting, diarrhea, and decreased scent detection capacity. 70% of seropositive dogs had a known exposure to a COVID-19 positive individual. In the majority of cases, that would be a handler or household member, um, but for a few cases, that was kennel staff for working dogs housed in a kennel as opposed to with their handler. Next slide, please. Working dogs with known SARS-CoV-2 exposure were more likely to test positive compared to those with no reported exposure based on chi-score analysis. So 34% of working dogs with a known COVID-19 exposure tested seropositive compared to just 15% of those with no reported COVID-19 exposure. Um, next slide, please. So we also uh, sought to conduct interviews of handlers of SARS-CoV-2 seropositive working dogs. Um, however, not all handlers wish to be interviewed. Thus far, we've conducted about uh, interviews with about 40% of the handlers of the seropositive dogs. And we discussed medical history, the home environment, the role of the dog, and the duty environment. Current or recent valley fever was identified in several seropositive dogs, noting a possible connection due to potential immunocompromised status. And in the duty environment, possible occupational risks identified included exp exposure to the public, such as at public events like concerts or other events with crowds um, and public demonstrations where officer, often police officers will uh, do an expose, exposure of what their of what their dogs are trained to do so that the public can can understand and it's really a public relations event and also exposure to human co-workers such as in the office or on patrol um, at various various instances whether it's saying hi along your day whether it's saying hi to a dog before they do a building search when a lot of officers are present um, that was also identified. And for all working dogs that were seropositive that we interviewed, um, the coworkers of their handler are their coworkers as well. And this was the exposure that was reported in all seropositive dogs. Not all seropositive dogs reported exposure to the public, but every single dog reported exposure to human coworkers because they're, again, their handlers, coworkers are theirs as well. Next slide, please. 
So to our knowledge, this is the first study looking at SARS-CoV-2 seroprevalence in working dogs. Again, there are many known SARS-CoV-2 infection in canines, mostly following close contact with a COVID-19 positive person. The evidence we found of SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies in working dogs with no reported exposure to COVID-19 highlights the potential risks that working dogs may face as a result of occupational exposures in their duty environments. Though clinical signs were not reported by handlers for most seropositive dogs, only 13% reported clinical signs, changes in scent detection was reported for one seropositive dog, indicating the potential for impacts on this ability due to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Next slide, please. Anosmia, which is the partial or full loss of smell that can be either temporary or permanent, is known to occur in humans due to SARS-CoV-2 infection and following infection. However, anosmia due to SARS-CoV-2 infection in animals remains unknown. The implication of anosmia in working dogs may include compromised scent detection ability, which would jeopardize many areas of public health and safety. For these reasons, further research is desperately needed to specifically investigate these potential impacts. Next slide, please. So our study just ended literally as of yesterday. Our next steps will include analysis of study data to identify risk factors associated with SARS-CoV-2 transmission, We'll also continue handler interviews and later complete a qualitative review to assess potential impacts of SARS-CoV-2 infection on working dog roles and commonalities. And lastly, we plan to conduct a veterinary chart abstraction with the clinic that serves as our working dog study site. The clinic tests working dogs annually for valley fever, so we intend to conduct an analysis on our entire study sample to determine if there is an association between SARS-CoV-2 infection and valley fever in working dogs by looking again, not just at those that we've interviewed, um, but at the entire sample, both of seropositive and seronegative dogs. There are currently no specific policies of SARS-CoV-2 in place, of SARS-CoV-2 surveillance in place for working dogs in the various agencies that employ them. So we plan to work towards publishing these results, the results from the study in the future, as they can assist agencies in developing novel policies to ensure the, effect, the effectiveness of their working dogs. The surveillance conducted in this study will serve as a framework that can translate beyond SARS-CoV-2 to conduct future zoonotic re disease research with this population. And we are glad to be a part of keeping the animals that protect us safe themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So quick acknowledgements, um, just a thank you to our working dog study site, Dr. Sabota and his staff, my mentors, Heather and Irene at ADHS, and our colleagues at Tijan, Haley Aglum, Nate Sarbo, Heather Mead, and John Elton. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, there is contact information for myself. Um, and there is also contact information for our team that does uh, work, again, beyond the working dogs, but does um, SARS-CoV-2 surveillance in animals in, throughout Arizona. So that is our COVID and pet, COVID pet project, AZ at tgen.org is the email for our team. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Our final presentation, assessing carriers of pathogenic leptospira species in the U.S. Virgin Islands and their risk to animal and public health is by Jarlath Nally. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jarlath Nally. I'm based at the National Animal Disease Center in Ames, Iowa. and I'm very happy to be able to talk to you today about leptospira and leptospirosis. It's a global disease. It's a neglected disease and it's endemic in the US. Now, before I talk about some recent work we did in the US Virgin Islands, I just want to provide some very brief background. Next slide, please. So this is to give you a visual of pathogenic lepospires. As you can see, they're very atypical bacteria. They have an unusual morphology. They're highly motile. Uh, they're also highly fastidious, but in recent years, we developed new techniques to uh, improve on the ability to culture these organisms from hosts. Next slide, please. In addition to having an atypical morphology, they have an unusual genome structure. They are characterized with two uh, uh, chromosomes, uh, and that has allowed us to gain a lot of uh, information based on the genome content of multiple species uh, that are currently involved in infections. I put up this information about Lepospira interrogans and Lepospira bulbs petersoni 
uh, genome size. As you can see, they have a genome size that differs by approximately 700,000 base pairs. So it really should be no surprise that different species in this genus can cause different clinical signs of infection in different mammalian hosts, and that they do that they would have different metabolic requirements uh, and different pathogenic mechanisms of infection. Uh, but there are currently more than 38 pathogenic species uh, that have been defined. Next slide, please. So this makes the transmission cycle uh, and understanding the epidemiology of leptospires uh, very difficult. Um, leptospires are typically shed from an asymptomatic reservoir host into the environment where bacteria can continue to survive and transmission to the incidental host or direct contact with a, a reservoir host uh, can lead to acute disease, not just in humans, but in domestic animal species as well. Next slide, please. In addition to having a large number of species, there is an additional classification system uh, that relates to the serotype of leptospires. And we recognize a very distinct um, uh, relationship between specific serovars and, and specific host species. And so, for example, we recognize that rats are carriers for serovar Copenhageni, dogs as carriers for serovar Canicola, and cattle as, ser as carriers for serovar Harjo. However, incidental hosts are susceptible to infection with multiple species and multiple servers. And you can see that there are multiple servers within species. And in fact, for example, with uh, server Harjo, that also exists uh, in different species. So the epidemi epidemiology is quite complex. Next slide. Uh, but I just want to highlight the importance of not just relying on the genetic information of these uh, species, but on the importance of the serotype. So what I'm showing you here on the left-hand side is the total protein profile of three different servars in the species Boris Petersoni. And as you can see, the protein profiles are pretty similar. But if you look at, to the right-hand side of that uh, image, we're looking at the total LPS profile. Uh, of three different servers, and you can see that that is quite different. And this is important because the O antigen of the LPS really forms the basis of the classification system for serotyping, and that in turn informs our serologic diagnostic assays. And in fact, all our current Bactrian uh, vaccine strategies are based on having the correct servar in those Bactrians because the O antigen of the LPS is protective. So if we want to immunize a domestic animal species, we have to ensure that we're not only immunizing with the correct species, but with the correct cerevar. Next slide, please. So if we're gonna do accurate epidemiology, we need to know what species we're dealing with. We need to know what serogroup we're dealing with. And ideally, we also need to know what cerevar we're dealing with. Whether you're involved in human medicine or animal medicine, the exclusive sources of the infection, direct or indirect, are the animal carriers. There's a series of assays available to detect leptospirosis. The MAT is a serologic agglutination test. It will confirm exposure to serogroups. It will not, it will not tell us anything about the species. The FAT is an antibody, fluorescent antibody test. Uh, which will detect pathogenic species, all pathogenic species ideally. The PCR provides a molecular mechanism to detect species, but not cerevar. Culture is definitive and will allow us to do a complete genome analysis as well as a complete serotyping analysis. Next slide, please. So in 2017, hurricanes Irma and Maria passed through the US Virgin Islands. Shortly thereafter, the first human cases of leptospirosis were diagnosed in the USVI. And so I just want to talk about some recent studies we did in the USVI to detect reservoir hosts of infection to determine what species and servars were being circulated in animal populations on the island. Now, obviously, there are a lot of people involved in these studies, but I just want to especially recognize a couple of individuals. Next slide, please. Springer Brown and Hannah Cranford on site at USVI collecting samples, and Rick Hornsby and Camilla Hammond in Ames, Iowa doing all the culture work. Next slide, please. So in these two studies, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about the culture aspects uh, to highlight this, the importance of the culture. When we first looked at the USVI, 
USVI mongoose across the three islands. 10% uh, of those animals were positive. We recovered 27 isolates. Next slide, please. When we did the speciation of the 27 isolates, 25 belonged to Lepsipara bogus petersoni, one Lepsipara kirshneri, and one uh, species in Terrigans. Next slide, please. Because we had recovered the cultured isolate, we were also able to do serotyping, and all the bogus petersoni isolates belong to serogroup Sejro. And since we published this work, we've been able to serotype a subset of these isolates. They belong to Cerebar recreo. Next slide, please. When we look at the USVI rodents uh, collected across the three islands, uh, including both mice and rats, over 42% of rodents were culture positive. We recovered uh, 60 uh, cultures. Next slide, please. Of the 60 isolates, 48 were borgs peters and I, three were Kirsten and I, and it turned out that nine rodents were co-infected with both borgs peters and I and Kirsten and I. Next slide, please. Again, because we had the recovered isolate, we were also do, able to do a comprehensive serotyping. All the borgs peters and I isolates derived from the rodents belong to serogroup Balam, and again, a subset was subsequently serotyped as belonging to Cerevar arborea. The Kirshneri isolates were serogroup Ictral, and interesting to note, Kirshneri was only found in St. Croix, uh, including those rodents which were carrying uh, co-infection with Borgs Peters and I and Kirshneri. Next slide, please. So this is the point I really want to highlight in terms of the molecular epidemiology versus the importance of serotyping. Both USVI mongoose and rodents are acting as reservoir hosts for Borgs Petersoni, but in the case of the mongoose, they're shedding serogroup Sejro, whereas the rodents are shedding serogroup Balam. Now, what's the significance? These are, in essence, completely different organisms. Uh, the gold standard test at the present is to use the hamster model of infection to assess the virulence of these different isolates. If we take the serogroup Sejro, and do experimental inoculations of hamsters, we do not see any clinical signs of the disease in the hamsters. With three weeks post-infection, all hamsters are kidney culture positive, indicating that in the hamster, these isolates are causing a persistent renal infection. In contrast, when we look at rodents, the rodent isolates belonging to serogroup Balam, when these isolates were evaluated in the hamster model of infection, they cause a very severe lethal acute disease process that was evident after four days post-infection. So at four days after an inoculation via the IP route of infection, uh, the hamsters had to be euthanized. And in fact, when we evaluated this further via the conjunctival inoculation route, uh, they also resulted in a very severe acute lethal disease process. Next slide, please. So, um, I just want to highlight the, the importance of culture. It's definitive in, def in defining what reservoir hosts are present. It's definitive because the recovery of the isolate allows for a complete genome uh, analysis as well as a complete serotyping analysis. Leptospires are highly fastidious, but we have improved in our ability to culture these in recent years. And I think this is one of the benefits of the project here was to demonstrate that samples collected over 2000 miles away could be shipped and successfully cultured over time. The mongoose act as a reservoir for Borgs Peters and Isera Group Sejro. The rodents act as a reservoir for, Bor for Borgs Peters and Isera Group Balam. Both can carry and excrete cursionary and, sorry, cursionary and in the case of the mongoose, uh, interrogants. What's the advantage of having cultured isolates? As I indicated, it allows us to do a complete genome analysis as well as serotyping, which in turn provides accurate epidemiology. The current serologic assays require the use of live organisms uh, to detect a glutinating antibody, uh, and it also means that you have relevant isolates, i.e. clinically uh, relevant isolates that are currently circulating in animal populations that can be used in bacterins to prevent disease and subsequent zoonotic transmission from domestic animals. Next slide, please. Um, as I say, there were many individuals involved in these studies, uh, but I just want to acknowledge uh, Rick Hornsby, Camilla Hammond, and Karen LeCount uh, at ARS and APHIS at the US Virgin Islands 
uh, Springer Brown and Hannah Cranford and CDC Renee Galloway and Elaine Schaefer. Thank you. I'm happy to participate in the discussion now and answer any questions. Thank you. And thanks to all of today's presenters for your informative presentations. Next slide, please. And yes, thank you. Um, links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash 2022 slash june.html. We have time for a few questions. Please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send your questions and include the presenter's name or topic. Our first question um, is for Dr. Nally. With leptoceravars in cattle, is the prevalent cerevar harjo or harjo bovis? And additionally, is diagnosis of harjo bovis still a diagnosis of elimination? And um, so the first part of that question, uh, it's cerevar harjo. And um, the question asks whether it's harjo bovis, and I assume that's in comparison to harjo progitno. Progitno has not been cultured in the US, and um, so it's all harjo bovis. Uh, however, um, recent work has also detected another cerevar belonging to the borgs petersoni species. So Harjo belongs to borgs petersoni uh, but we also recently identified cerevar tarasovii, which belongs to uh, the species borgs petersoni in a uh, dairy herd in Minnesota. Thank you. And actually, uh, just uh, to follow up, uh, some recent work in Puerto Rico has also confirmed harjo in cows in Puerto Rico, as well as uh, Leptospira santorosii in dairy cows in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Our next question is for Gabriela. Um, are, are you aware of any studies that are planned or have been carried out for medical alert dogs, um, such as diabetic alert dogs or COVID sniffing dogs, to see if SARS-CoV-2 infection has any effect on their performance? So as of now, um, I don't believe there's any uh, study specifically looking at uh, medical alert dogs. I think what we're trying to do is um, continue our research. And as we start to close it out, you know, hopefully the analysis will give us continue to give us results that are useful to other partners, which, you know, we've communicated some things um, on an ad hoc basis. But uh, that's definitely something to look at in the future. I think it's also just the biggest uh, challenge with something like the specifically the working dog uh, research that we're doing is getting into the population. Um, so, it, you know, we went through a de definitely several means before we found this clinic to work with that sees the majority of the working dogs in, in the main valley in, in Arizona. So um, not, at this mo not at this moment, but that's definitely something to consider in the future. Thank you. And there's another question for you as well. How often do working dogs interact with their canine coworkers? Right. So um, if I understand the question correctly, um, the canine, can, working dogs don't typically interact with other animals while they're in their duty environment. Even if there are other working dogs of the interviews that I conducted and of speaking to our, our working dog vet, um, I can only think of one or two instances where uh, work, uh, one working dog will interact with another working dog. Um, even, even working dogs that live in the same house sometimes rarely interact, sometimes on purpose, sometimes not. Um, there's just, you know, they're usually a particular breed of uh, dog and, and they're focused on certain things, and, but some are, some are more affectionate. Um, the only other thing is that they sometimes interact rarely and in, obviously only in certain roles, sometimes interact with other dogs, like in the public, if they're patrolling a crowded event, like, you know, doing uh, bomb detection, for example, um, they might have some sort of pass by with an, another dog if, if, you know, animals are allowed at that event. Um, but yeah, that's, it's not, not often at all. Thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Schaefer. Is there, are there any plans for the guide to be translated into other languages? Not at this time, but uh, that is a great question and something I will explore with CST and CDC. Thank you. Um, our next questions, we'll go back to Dr. Nally. Um, we have a couple questions about leptospira isolates. Um, do you have any from human cases in the Virgin Islands, as well as from domestic or feral swine? 
Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any uh, isolates from human cases in the Virgin Islands, but um, as we have improved on our media, I do know that CDC have been uh, working to obtain isolates from human patients in Puerto Rico. Um, what was the next question? Are there any isolates from domestic or feral swine as well? Uh, no, not yet. We haven't, uh, we haven't attempted feral swine in the US Virgin Islands. Thank you. Um, and then I have another question for Gabriella. Um, what is the specificity of the SARS-CoV-2 serology test you used in dogs? And is there any cross-reactivity with canine GI coronavirus? Thank you for that question. Um, so I'm not positive what the specificity of the test is. Um, if you reach out, uh, if you reach out to um, either my email there or I could, you know, the, the other email, um, the COVID pet project is at tgen.org, we can uh, get you that information um, in terms of the cross reactivity uh, there, there's not. Thank you. And then one more question for you. What was the protocol for isolating a positive dog? Yeah, so this is interesting. Um, we did not have any PCR positives. Um, so in terms of if a dog came up positive, all dogs came up zero positive, um, you know, not indicating current infection. Um, so there, there really wasn't a protocol for isolating the dog. Um, and for the most part, um, you know, we had a couple of inquiries from, you know, state and federal agencies when one of their dog would, dogs would come up positive, just, you know, questions and, and kind of how to deal with that. And so we kind of explained, you know, what I just said um, and, and tried to work with them. But the, the hope is that, you know, we're looking at serology. The hope is that, you know, when we, we can help to create policies so that when there's a, you know, a, a positive handler, you know, that there is some sort of protocol for the canine you know, especially looking at, you know, these dogs are, do complete training on a very regular basis. So they, for the scent detection dogs, it would be known if they're missing, if they have decreased scent detection, um, you know, they would be missing known finds on their, you know, usually sometimes daily or four to five times a week uh, training. Um, but, but yeah. Thank you. And then we have a few more questions for Dr. Nally. Um, in some Caribbean islands, there are native primates, and do you have any plans to evaluate such primates for lepto? Uh, we don't have any current plans, but um, we're always open to collaboration with, uh, with those who are interested in doing such studies. Thank you. And then an additional question about isolates again. Do you have any leptospira isolates from dogs in the Virgin Islands? Uh, actually, yes, we do. We have two. Uh, one was a species in Terrigans and one was a species Kirshneri, and both belong to the Syro group Ectora hemorrhagia. Thank you. If you have other questions for today's presenters, we've included their email addresses on this slide, on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. A video of today's webinar will be posted within 30 days. Next slide. We appreciate you all joining us please join us for the next Zohu call in two months. We do not have a call in July. Um, our next call will be on August 3rd. Thank you for your participation. This ends today's webinar.